Welcome to the tourist boom at the bottom of the world. Yes! I just went to heaven. <laughs> it's a front row seat to a remarkable show. Majestic humpback whales. Oh my gosh. Frolicking fur seals. An army of curious, charming penguins. All that framed with a backdrop that defies description. Nothing but miles of mountains, glaciers, and icebergs as far as the eye can see. The icy continent of Antarctica is suddenly hot. A record 50,000 people came last year. GQ magazine recently said, now is the time to go. The New York Times said, forget Times Square, ring in the new year right here. The main attraction of the area is just, it's a place where people are irrelevant. People just don't count. You're, you're coming here purely as a visitor. You have no other impact. David McGonigal has led over 120 trips to Antarctica for One Ocean Expeditions, a Canadian tour company promoting environmentally conscious travel. These are trips where the scenery comes with equal helpings of science and history. Shackleton's endurance expedition. We'll talk about this in more detail later. This is definitely not budget travel. It's about twelve to twenty thousand dollars per person for this two-week cruise. That includes kayaking, hiking, and motorboat excursions by day. White tablecloth meals. From an ecological perspective, this is actually spectacular. And lectures from scientists and naturalists by night. We really have entered this winter wonderland. McGonagall's job is to keep the roughly 140 passengers who have come from around the world safe and satisfied. Some people are just down here for the history, and so you've got to find some historical elements to deliver. Some people just want wildlife. Some people are really just down here for the ice. And it's a matter of juggling that all around and trying to pull together a plan. The journey starts at the southern tip of South America and through the infamous Drake Passage, home to some of the roughest seas known to man. Two days later, the ship finally crosses the Antarctic Circle, one of the southernmost latitudes on Earth. This sort of place, it deepens your understanding of the world, and, um, but also of yourself. Hermione and John Roth made the trip from Northern England. She's a child and family therapist. He's an Anglican priest. We wanted to come and see it before either it disappeared or we disappeared. We are probably spending more on this holiday than we've spent on our holidays on our, in our entire lives. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Antarctica! Yusuf Hashim retired almost 20 years ago. He was a marketing director for Shell Oil in Malaysia. He convinced nearly 50 of his friends and family to join him on this trip. So what are you doing here on the bottom of the earth? Uh, spending my children's inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> Do they know that this is what's happening? Yeah, that's one of them over there, so it's bonding time. I've been here four times now, and, uh, and I will never tire of looking at icebergs and uh, penguins and, uh, you know, the, the, the scenery, you know, it makes, makes it all worth living. In addition to all the wildlife, the ship visits historic sites, like this abandoned British scientific base from the 1950s, as well as active bases. 11 scientists from Ukraine work and live here year-round. And the tourists can sample the homemade whiskey made with glacial ice at one of the southernmost drinking holes in the world. But visiting Antarctica until relatively recently was a trip no human had ever made. It's absolutely incredible that our seventh continent, our newest continent, was discovered less than 200 years ago, changing what we understand about the globe today. Crossing the circle. Katie Murray is a polar historian who works for One Ocean, teaching visitors about the earliest Antarctic explorers. British naval explorer is down here trying to locate the magnetic South Pole. Like Britain's James Cook, or the ill-fated race to the South Pole in 1911 between Robert Falcon Scott and Roald Amundsen. Or perhaps the most famous Antarctic adventure story, Ernest Shackleton's dramatic endurance voyage several years later. We talked with Murray in the ship's movie theater. It's quite incredible, actually, that a um, hundred years after the heroic age, just over a hundred years since Scott and the Polar Party died on their return from the South Pole, and you've got these great stories of endurance and suffering, we can now come to Antarctica effectively for fun. This record number of tourists coming here has been growing steadily since the 1980s when just a few thousand made the trip every year. 
When the Soviet Union collapsed, the Soviet fleet of ice-strengthened vessels became available and people realised they could actually charter those and bring those down. And that was what started the whole rush in the 1990s. Today, more and more tour companies are rolling out new fleets of luxury ice-strengthened ships capable of navigating the icy waters here. But the arrival of more and more visitors to Antarctica is also leading to concerns about their impact on this pristine ecosystem. Antarctica is really the world's last great wilderness. There's no permanent human population there. It's a continent that is for nature. And I think that's a really important symbol because, you know, so many other places where human civilization has spread to, we have destroyed the environment. Claire Christian is the executive director of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, a Washington, D.C.-based advocacy group. She believes tourism has so far been a force for good, galvanizing people to care about a continent that is thousands of miles from their homes. Right now, tourists only visit the Antarctic Peninsula because it's the most accessible and most scenic part of the continent. But Christian notes this is also a region stressed by climate change. So how many more visitors can the region handle? Right now, there may not, it may not be able to, we may not be able to see a lot of effects, um, but you know, if you suddenly have a sharp increase in the number of people who are visiting a small colony every day, that might start to have an impact. Remember, Antarctica has no government, no nation runs this place, and currently all tour groups are governed by a strict but voluntary set of regulations. For example, only one ship at a time is allowed at designated sites. There are rules about how many people can go ashore and how close they can get to wildlife. One Ocean Expeditions mandates all tourists vacuum and clean their gear before going ashore so that no foreign seeds or dirt end up on land. All returning gear gets a similar scrub every day. But invasive species have already taken hold. This moss is from the Arctic. A trace amount somehow made the 12,000-mile trip. And there are also concerns about wildlife. Two of the three penguin species on the peninsula are in decline. Researchers believe it's being driven in part by a warming environment. Given that, are all these humans an added stress? You see all that reddish brown material on the ground behind me? That's all penguin guano or penguin poop. And not only does it make this whole area have a very unique aroma, but scientists have been measuring the stress hormones that are released into guano at places where tourists show up and at places where tourists never go. And for the penguins so far at least, it does not seem that the presence of tourism is causing them any problems. Andrea Raya Ray is a conservation biologist based in Ushuaia, Argentina, a city where the bulk of all Antarctic tourism begins. <laughs> Raya Ray says that while tourism is showing little impact thus far, she worries about the estimated 40% growth in the industry. The tourism put an extra uh, pressure on the ecosystem. One ship, it's okay, two, okay, three, but 10 at the same time pointing at them, it's a stressful. It's also a concern shared by those within the tourism industry. It's going to be more a matter of just how do you manage the numbers when there's just nowhere left to go and you've got more ships coming down. As for visitors like John and Hermione Roth, they feel incredibly lucky to have seen the wonders of Antarctica up close but they admit they're worried about their own impact. There is a, a, a growth of tourism that does leave a mark. However careful we are, it leaves a mark. And so it's a very difficult balance. I mean, I'm really thrilled that we've come, but I hope not too many more people will come. <laughs> For now though, there is no sign that this tourist boom is slowing. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm William Brangham on the Antarctic Peninsula.